Okay, hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Um, we're joined by Andrew Swetman from ThinkStep and the topic is going to be what every manufacturer should know about product compliance reporting. Um, Andrew is responsible for the development of the compliance software and associated services from ThinkStep. He's worked in product sustainability and compliance for over 20 years in various countries um, and he's worked on quite a few interesting projects including with uh, Siemens where they looked at uh, providing a fully integrated compliance solution for their team center software um, and that's now used by several global companies including Seagate, Emerson and Caterpillar. Now before I hand over to Andrew, um, I just want to say if anyone has any difficulty hearing or viewing the slides, if you just get in touch with us via the Q&A box or the chat box on the right hand side of the screen, uh, one of us will be able to help you from there. So without any further fuss, I'll pass you over on to Andrew um, and if you just let me hand over controls. Mm -hmm. Andrew, you should be good to go. Okay, okay. Thank you very much um, for that. I'd like to start, and basically the format today is we'll be I'll be presenting for 30 minutes, and that will allow for 15 minutes uh, following that um, regarding any questions or issues that you may have with the uh, content of the presentation. And thank you uh, very much for making the time to uh, listen to this presentation today. Okay, as was mentioned, uh, my name's Andrew Swetman. I'm the Compliance uh, Solutions Manager um, for ThinkStep. I've worked in this role for uh, 20 years, working in various uh, locations to help companies uh, ensure their products uh, remain compliant with environmental laws. Essentially, the key criteria is that companies want to be able to sell their products anywhere in the world and want to make sure that environmental laws or legislation don't um, create any impediments to being able to sell uh, in those particular markets. Okay, a little bit about um, ThinkStep, who, who I work with. Uh, ThinkStep uh, is one of the world's leading sustainability um, consultancies. You probably know us for uh, our work in life cycle assessment um, and a range of other consulting uh, areas. We have locations uh, around uh, the world and are up to focus on uh, core sustainability uh, issues for clients in any particular uh, region. My particular role is in the compliance area, but we offer a broad uh, suite of services across all sustainability issues. Essentially, the uh, area that I work in, so you can understand where this fits within the uh, ThinkStep uh, suite of products, is where we do corporate social responsibility. We also have a major focus on uh, product compliance and sustainability. As I said, you probably know our work from Garby or life cycle uh, assessment. We have suites in those areas to deal with uh, life cycle assessment and EPDs. Uh, my role is really on the right-hand side, which is really in product compliance. So those um, requirements are, which are mandatory by um, government, what that enables us to do is if we have um, voluntary or sustainability issues, we're able to support also your um, legal obligations to meet um, sustainability or other environmental requirements as well. Um, we work with a range of companies and particularly in the material sector, as mentioned, we work with Caterpillar, Seagate and Emerson. We've also worked with even um, you know, people in the field of car racing in terms of being able to support their uh, material structures and uh, compliance efforts in diverse range of industries. Okay, what I'll do is I'll jump straight into the um, presentation now. As was outlined in the notes, what we'd like to do is uh, lay to walk away with a range of uh, learning outcomes um, from today's uh, presentation. And essentially the focus today is now we to uh, quickly look at materials, understand how you can review materials and understand compliance obligations, look at ways in which uh, those processes can be made more effective and looking at different strategies for that basically looking at the ways of uh, having an integrated data structure to be able to do that, if you're using software to be able to achieve that, and also looking at some of the tools that we've developed that allow um, rapid compliance or compliance integrated into the uh, design process, and also how this fits into a broader compliance sustainability strategy. 
the, the slides we'll go through today is basically I'll explain why we look at compliance, some uh, background in terms of the regulatory drivers um, for compliance. I'll look at how compliance fits into the design process. I'll look at how you can look at compliance from a materials um, perspective in terms of risk management and also product life cycle management. When we basically talk about product life cycle management, we often mean the complete management of the, of the product uh, throughout all of the design um, stages, a little bit different to um, LCA, life cycle assessment. Okay, so what I'd like to do is start with, in terms of why we actually um, care about um, compliance. And essentially, we live in a world made of uh, complex products, made of um, complex materials uh, that come from a range of locations throughout the world. Uh, an example here is uh, the uh, Apple products, a recent um, MacBook uh, launch in various different colours, again coming from a range of um, sources throughout the world in terms of materials, usually assembled in China and then distributed um, throughout the world. One area where we believe uh, compliance has been uh, highlighted is the fact that companies like uh, Apple during their keynote presentations, every time they release uh, one of these suite of products, they in many ways uh, highlight the environmental uh, aspects of the products. And essentially many of the issues, and particularly the products I just showed before is, is the MacBook, is they'll often list the particular environmental credentials relating to the products. And in many cases, those are directly related to a product uh, compliance obligation and often a substance compliance uh, obligation. So we have, say, Energy Star, which is uh, Energy EP, which is an overall um, goal for meeting sustainability obligations, but all the rest, such as arsenic free, mercury free, uh, BFR, which is flame retardants, PVC, uh, beryllium, and recyclability, all of the middle ones are actually related to material or um, substance compliance. And again, this not only speaks to the ability to sell products um, globally and meet all these particular market obligations without any uh, impacts in terms of being able to sell to any of these uh, markets, but also uh, consumer preferences to actually have products which are, uh, have minimised um, um, harmful materials or substances within this. So we basically see this as both a driver from a regulatory perspective in terms of a, a legal obligation, but also from a consumer demand um, and uh, overall uh, uh, corporate social responsibility objective for companies. Again, um, in terms of where uh, uh, compliance fits within the uh, overall scheme of um, a business value for sustainability is essentially we see that um, regulatory environmental compliance usually fits obviously within a regulatory driven and it's an external um, um, process. So essentially it's a must have and it usually is developed from an external process uh, through from outside of the company in terms of where it fits within the um, matrix of uh, sustainability um, business issues. Um, in terms of a case study of where this um, goes wrong is essentially there's a classic case study which has been mentioned uh, many times and I'm sure many people on the call uh, already know this example but it's, it's a classic one that is often referred to is that when uh, compliance uh, uh, problems occur essentially it can result in significant product recalls, costs for companies in terms of being able to refit a product and the potential impact on the company's reputation. Sony essentially had a classic issue like this where their PlayStation was withdrawn before a, a significant product launch before Christmas um, uh, you know, in the early 2000s. Okay, so basically we've outlined that um, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a critical requirement. It's um, all leading companies um, do this. It's really a matter of uh, how people actually um, come to terms with this and actually make sure they meet the requirements and actually do it in, effect, in a, an efficient and effective way within their organisation. What I'll do is I'll go through some of the uh, regulations. Basically, uh, as um, new information is developed about uh, particular environmental concerns, these are often translated 
into environmental laws and regulations. And these continue to become more complex and uh, developed in many different jurisdictions. So it's never a sort of a static area. It's always changing and developing based on scientific discovery or particular um, regulatory obligations in different um, jurisdictions. The sort of issues that we uh, tend to cover in terms of products from a regulatory perspective, the most well-known in terms of an historical issue is uh, ozone depletion, but we also look at things like eco-labelling, uh, end-of-life packaging, batteries, restriction of hazardous substances, eco-design reach, greenhouse gases, conflict minerals, nanotechnology, and even the circular economy uh, starts to have regulatory requirements for products. Some of the ones I'll, I'll go through briefly because they are of particular significance to industries and are really the leaders in terms of the substance um, requirements is most people have probably heard of ROS, which is the Restriction of Hazardous Substance um, Directive in uh, the European Union, and this has been followed by various um, uh, versions in China, Korea. Essentially, this started the whole process where uh, companies had to look at their particularly electronic products and look at um, reducing substances such as heavy metals and flame retardants. Then um, most people are aware of REACH, which is essentially the most um, comprehensive chemicals um, law, which is, again, European-focused in terms of actually taking a holistic review of all chemicals released. So not just having a list of substances, but saying that companies have to be responsible for their particular chemicals as they release these uh, onto the marketplace and being able to um, register them uh, within the European Union. One thing that has uh, been driven from... America, but is, is, is a new level of chemical restrictions, is linking chemical restrictions and the sources of those chemicals to actually the social impact of these particular um, materials and substances and conflict minerals, which are started in the States and now moving to the European Union, is an example of uh, looking at substances that have a social impact. We also have things uh, such as end-of-life Vehicles, directive, batteries and packaging are other laws that have a substance restriction component in that. And beyond that, we have uh, eco-labels and other labelling systems or uh, voluntary systems that tend to are the leading indicators of where these regulations uh, are heading. Okay, so what I'll do, do now is I'll go through how basically these compliance tools fit within a design process and a methodology or a maturity curve as to how these issues are considered by companies. Essentially, the core thing we're always looking for is to be able to introduce these issues as early in the design process as possible so that rather than, rather than having to consider them later where we have uh, the highest cost, we essentially look at them early in the conceptual design process and reduce the uh, cost of having to consider those issues. Obviously, as uh, the design process develops, it becomes more expensive to uh, create change, so we're basically looking to push all of these issues much earlier into the design process. One of the key issues in terms of a maturity process for this approach is that uh, we basically have uh, business risk. If we don't know anything about our products, we need to know more about um, the substances and materials in our products to be able to uh, understand our particular um, risk. And companies tend to go along a maturity curve that I'll explain in terms of how they actually understand their um, business risk and collect more information so they can actually understand their um, uh, compliance obligations. And I'll go through that quickly. So essentially we have, most companies start with the concept of no data. We basically know we have to be compliant, but we really don't understand uh, what we need to do. And this is like uh, hear no evil, speak no evil, and see no evil in terms of you know, potentially ignoring it or wanting to start a process. Most companies will start with some sort of regulatory tracking in terms of just understanding what issues affect them and their particular industry. And in many ways, people will do initial research on that or they may go to a, a standardised tool such as compliance and risks or NHSA, EIA track to uh, create some um, uh, regulatory review of their particular products. Companies may also look at certification and that's essentially looking at products and doing destructive testing and actually understanding the chemical makeup of uh, each of the products that they have. 
uh, this is actually uh, uh, quite expensive. So companies will you do it usually on a sample and not necessarily for all of their um, products. And this will basically allow you to have a certificate of compliance. The other thing that uh, companies have now done is industry-wide is basically creating um, negative or reportable lists and basically saying uh, what chemicals can and can't they use and be able to have those as industry-wide standards so that each company doesn't have to uh, do this individually. And basically what we have is restricted um, substance um, lists. These are usually industry-based, such as Gadsel for Automotive, there's um, uh, JIG or EIC now for electronics, or the AAFA list for apparel. And this is an example of those used for apparel that basically provide a list of substances that uh, can't be used in the uh, textile industry. Once companies actually work out what substances they can and can't use, some will actually go to the extent of doing what's called a full material declaration, where they will ask suppliers to be able to explain every substance or chemical uh, used in their products. So even if a regulation changes, they have a complete database of all the substances and chemicals used in their products and be able to actually understand that so that if a regulation changes, they're uh, well in advance of that. The only problem with full material declaration is it is quite a, uh, uh, a, a tedious process in terms of being able to collect all the uh, accurate information down to the substance level in a uh, product. Also, um, beyond the restricted substance lists, there's been um, tools for um, declarations where industries have joined together, and these include IMDS for the automotive sector and tools such as BombCheck for the electronic sector where uh, manufacturers can look at their suppliers in a single place to be able to collect their information from a single uh, location. One thing that we're particularly interested in at ThinkStep is looking at new ways to do this and make this whole process more efficient. And one thing that we've looked at is basically the ability to look at um, materials and be able to look at the risks associated with various materials used. And one of the reasons for that is that any company wanting to be compliant has to uh, follow a due diligence process in order to um, protect their uh, legal obligations. And what you'll usually have to do is is basically identify your risks, make sure you document those risks and be prepared in case there's a compliance um, requirement for that. And a materials approach actually um, supports that. So for example, in REACH, you basically have to go through a process of due diligence so uh, you're able to understand the substances or materials in your, in your product to be able to um, meet those obligations. So in REACH, if you can basically notify your substances, tell your clients, report to any regulatory bodies, uh, you basically meet the due diligence um, process. The problem with that approach is that most companies will know their materials in their products, but they won't necessarily know all the substances of concern within their, within their products that they're using. So what we've developed is really a process to say, well, you know your materials, and then we can help you to actually understand what are the likely substances of concern within that. So we've developed a uh, software tool that really allows you not just to look at your substances, which are sometimes hard to gather, but to actually look at your materials and create databases based on our strong um, substance and material knowledge and to say, if you're using a particular material, it's likely or may be containing this substance of a concern. So you can do a, a, basically a very uh, quick risk screen of your materials rather than having to go through that process of doing certifications or having to go into your supply chain into detail. And basically this approach allows you to um, minimise risk and do it in a rapid um, manner. I'll basically, um, and we basically have this available as a software tool on the ThinkStep um, platform, and I'll quickly show a movie which will explain how this particular process works. Can you show the movie, please? So basically, in this approach, um, what we do is we have a software tool that can look at companies' um, bills of materials. Um, hello, I just want to show the movie. Um, Sorry, Andrew, that blank. should be it. Yeah, I just need that, that to play. Okay, all right, thanks. 
can people see the movie playing? Okay. Oh, uh, if it, I, I'm just still wondering if this movie is actually um, progressing. Hi, Andrew. It's it's playing from our end. Do you want me to put it back to the start? Uh, okay. No, it's okay. Okay, it's okay. I'm seeing it now. It may just be latency. Essentially, what this um, tool allows us to do is to take um, standard bills of materials from companies, and usually bills of material have materials, but not necessarily substances associated with them. So with this particular approach, we can take a bill of material, take all the materials, and we basically have a database of standard substances of concern, whether it be REACH, ROS, conflict minerals that actually appear in the product. And we can basically do a grading um, based on standard materials and actually look into a product and to see whether there's failures, passes, or um, failures that may actually be able to have exemptions associated with those processes. So in this example, we're going into a toaster and we're actually looking to see um, where we actually have materials and we're able to actually delve into the bill of material structure and be able to see into that based on common materials such as ABS, steel or other materials and actually able to see what substances of concern actually sit within that product. We're not having to go uh, into the supply chain. We're basically using... Uh, uh, our uh, understanding of um, substance of concern, appearing in materials, and do a risk um, screen of this approach. And we can basically look at um, low risk, high risk, and medium risk um, to, based on uh, the likelihood of these, uh, these substances of concern to actually occur within a product. So we basically look at this as being a much more rapid way of companies be able to say, I'm using ABS, it may contain a flame retardant, it may contain cadmium and allowing you to actually see, before you go into a deep dive process, being able to see the uh, potential risks associated with that. Can I get control back of the presentation? Yep. Okay. So we have at one level basically a risk screener that allows companies to very quickly look at materials. We have over 130 different materials and we have all of the substances that may trigger results for ROS, REACH, conflict minerals, et cetera, be able to do a very um, over, uh, quick screen based on materials used. What we also do is we actually go into a much more detailed approach with our clients who may use PLM systems. And we work with Siemens in terms of those companies who actually have an integrated product lifecycle management process. And whilst this sort of seems like a complex diagram, what, it, what PLM does for uh, companies is to actually integrate all of the design process and all of the requirements into one uh, single um, system. And many companies use a PLM uh, process and it thinks that we essentially support companies to take their PLM systems, we then integrate substance um, restrictions into that process and be able to look at your bills of materials or uh, structures within that to be able to do compliance natively within PLM systems. And what we essentially do is we will take bills of materials in a PLM system, be able to take supplier information, grade within the PLM system, and provide reporting results. So essentially we're able to help companies manage, validate, and control their particular risks um, through a PLM system uh, using our um, compliance risk manager process that links into uh, PLM systems, particularly the Siemens Team Center system. And what that allows us to do is to do um, data management. We basically can collect supplier information and have it all within a PLM system from a substance compliance um, perspective. It allows us to take all those de declaration systems such as IMDS or BombCheck and bring all those into a single um, system rather than having to have those external to the company or in outside tools. It allows us to do validation so we can actually then um, check um, that information and make sure that we actually see whether there's passes or failures based on that approach where we look at substances of concern within a bill of materials. Uh, can we just show, just show the video now of this one? Okay. Well, all right. Okay. So just as an example of how um, how this works within a PLM system, 
is because the PLM system basically has a lot of detail in terms of bills of materials or structures, we take our compliance knowledge our knowledge of all of the substances, concerns and regulations and build it into the reporting um, mechanisms within these PLM systems. So the same way that an engineer may look in a PLM system for looking at material structures such as strength or tensile strength, we actually start to build up uh, compliance and knowledge within a PLM system. So we look for things such as are you using lead or are you are using a conflict mineral? And not only can you do the reporting in that, but you can link this to CAD models. And as you can see here, there's essentially a 3D model of how uh, a compliance uh, review can occur so that people can actually visually see uh, compliance within a particular product. So we can check for uh, ROS compliance, it will look at the bill of material, and it will look for lead or other substances of concern to actually be able to see if there's a uh, compliance requirement um, within that. So again, what we do for companies is we essentially use our knowledge of um, substances and materials and build this into their own data models um, for um, their particular products. And this is an example within a, within a PLM system. So we have a risk arena for, uh, for simple levels, but we also have it for complex companies who work at the highest level in terms of PLM systems. So basically, uh, using these systems, we can uh, undertake reporting, and essentially what this allows us to do is we can actually uh, take our reporting uh, systems and build this into companies' uh, enterprise um, systems. And what we've found from companies is that basically, if they are into the enterprise system in terms of integrating compliance into their enterprise systems, their pain points is they don't want to have third-party um, systems. They want this synchronised with their engineering processes, so compliance or sustainability sits uh, within a, a good relationship with their engineering um, processes. They don't necessarily want to reinvent the wheel. And what we've done is been able to enable uh, engineers and uh, designers and compliance people to have one view on the world rather than having to constantly um, synchronise their data. And pretty much that's it in terms of questions. I know we're you know, pretty much on to the um, half hour, but essentially uh, that's the presentation for today. Again, what I've covered is uh, why compliance, um, what are the sort of regulatory drivers for that um, globally, a materials risk approach where we basically look at common materials and we're able to look at the substances of concern and be able to do a, a risk screen to see if your common materials happen to contain uh, substance of concern by looking at um, bill of materials um, structures and looking at uh, simple bills of materials. And we also uh, work, as many other companies do, in PLM systems and integrate compliance um, within that particular um, process as, as well. So from a small approach, really compliance can be taken from a risk screen approach all the way to fully detailed um, enterprise um, systems and in many ways the maturity curve is really where companies want to start with that and uh, may take years to get to a particular approach but there's certainly a proactive approach uh, ultimately saves companies um, time and money and reputational risk by following a, a maturity process. I think we're pretty much on, on the hour, perhaps one or two minutes early. Any questions? Great. Well, thank you very much for that, Andrew. That was very interesting. Um, we've already got a few questions in the Q&A okay. box, but just if anyone um, has got something to add, just drop it in there and we can work our way down to it. Um, so I guess one of the first questions to um, look at was, if you're able to summarize, Andrew, what, what do some of the best companies do in this mm -hmm. area? Yep. Um, that, was, that was one of the questions. Okay. Yep. Yeah, essentially what the best companies do, and some of the ones we've worked with, such as uh, Seagate, is probably the world's um, leader in this uh, area, is we mentioned the concept of full material declaration. And that's really the gold stamp of where companies want to be in this area. It takes a, a lot of effort, but a full materials declaration says we ask our suppliers or we look at our own processes and we actually understand not only the materials that we use, but what actually substances are used in those materials. 
so that every time a different regulation emerges or comes about, we don't have to resend questionnaires about a new particular substance of concern. So when conflict minerals came about, if you had a full material declaration, you could basically look through and see, are you using gold, tantalum, tin or tungsten within that full material um, declaration? You wouldn't then have to send out a new range of questionnaires. You may have to send out you know, supporting documentation, but you wouldn't actually have to send out um, you know, a review of you know, who's using gold, tungsten or tantalum. You would already have a complete database of all of the materials or substances um, used in your product already, and you can just say, now search for gold, now search for tungsten, and be able to review that in your, in your, in your um, full material declaration. That's probably the uh, leading edge in terms of um, the sort of companies that really uh, take uh, an approach um, like that. And that's essentially where it's, 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 a, it's a significant effort um, to do that and don't expect all companies um, to be there. But that's essentially probably one of the, the leading companies that we've seen and their ability to run constant reports and report to management on their particular compliance obligations almost on a daily basis in real time is really the sort of gold standard of where the industry is at the moment. Okay, and um, just the uh, same person actually sent a follow-up question, just basically, I think you touched on it a little bit at the end, but it was what, um, basically, is that only big companies that can do that? What if you're a smaller company, yep. can you, what can, what can yep. you do in this area? Yep, and essentially, the uh, approach that uh, we, we looked at some of the um, industry-wide um, tools such as IMDS or BombCheck where people can um, go in and get um, standard supplier information parts or materials in, in one of those um, tools. And basically a small company can access um, systems like that where there may be generic parts or, or, or products into one of those um, uh, single um, databases. As I also mentioned, a small company should probably do some sort of regulatory review to say what are the core uh, uh, substances or materials of concern for uh, them as a particular um, company. And the other thing that I mentioned in terms of our risk screening approach is really to say what are the sort of materials that you use. You may not know all the information. You may not have done a full review of your supply chain and ask them questionnaires. But if you can start to understand what are your basic materials and what are the sort of substances that commonly occur in those materials, um, you can tend to um, you know, get started quite quickly because it may be that a particular plastic you're choosing, such as ABS, may contain a particular flame retardant. So that puts you at risk um, in terms of uh, ROS, if you're in, in the uh, electronic sector, you may be using um, silicones or rubbers, and they may potentially contain um, substances of concern for reach. And being able to understand those certainly puts a small company uh, one step ahead um, in terms of being able to know their issues that they're facing. They may not know all of the constituents and substances that make up those materials, but if they can understand basic materials and the substances of concerns commonly held within that, that enables them to at least start to understand where their risks are in terms of being able to understand uh, compliance um, processes. Perfect. Okay, um, we've got another question. Um, someone was looking for the name of the software that matches materials to substances with risks. Yeah. Yep, yep. So basically, um, ThinkStep has put together a uh, platform. It's ThinkStep One that people will be uh, becoming more familiar with. And basically, the tool that we have developed within that is called the Compliance uh, Risk Screener. What we're currently doing is we're offering that as a, as a service offering and will then be uh, offering as a cloud-based solution um, later in the year. And again, it's, it's called Compliance um, Risk Screener. And what we have done is we've basically taken uh, a library of commonly used um, materials ranging from metals to plastics using our knowledge in the uh, you know, materials and substance space and being able to match those together. So you can look at a material and then be able to you know, match it up to a bill of material and be able to look at the substance. And that's called the Compliance um, Risk Screener. It's part of a new 
platform being developed by uh, ThinkStep where we allow um, uh, basically companies to become more engaged in these issues, not just um, um, making this uh, available or a concern that large companies uh, are only able to engage in, basically looking at something that we can provide to much smaller companies to at least be able to get a first understanding of their obligations and uh, issues in this space. So um, if anyone wants to contact me, we can provide further information about that particular product and the service offerings around that. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, we've also had someone asking um, if the slides and video are available um, at the end of this presentation. Um, I think we can say the, the video um, will be recorded and sent around to the current attendees, yeah. but uh, I, can't, um, I can't speak for you on the slides, Andrew. I think that's... Um, yeah, I'll, your, just need to, I'll just need to check with, 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 with marketing within ThinkStep just to make sure they're publicly available, um, but I'll, I'll get you a, 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 a you know, response within one hour after this, and just to make sure I'm I'm, I'm meeting the corporate obligations. Yep. Okay, <laughs> but happy understand. happy to do that. And if there's any questions that people have, um, particularly about uh, these particular issues, uh, I'm pretty much uh, available any time to be able to um, you know, respond to any issues or concerns, or if people have any need for any further details about any of this um, content. Sure. Well, when we um, when we put the the video recording live, there is also an opportunity for people to leave questions at the bottom of that, um, mm -hmm. and I can make sure Andrew you're notified when if there's any questions left, you can come back mm -hmm. and um, and check it out and uh, give your thoughts there as well. Yep. Yep. Cool. Um, we've got just another question there. So um, is what do you see um, the future issues being in terms of product mm -hmm. compliance? Okay. Yeah, the core issues uh, that, that we've seen is that I think um, REACH, uh, in terms of Europe, has really developed a framework for issues such as toxicology, whether that be human, you know, animal, or environment, and being able to register chemicals and understand their impacts from, from, from that particular toxicological uh, approach. Um, we're really seeing a movement more towards I suppose the uh, social impact of, of, of materials and whether that be the social impact of um, impact zones, uh, conflict zones such as uh, conflict minerals, but also starting to see um, you know, resource depletion as an issue. So rare earth metals where we're seeing materials that will have limits in the future because of the, uh, the depletion of those particular substances. So potentially restrictions or at least controls or an understanding as to where these particular materials that are being heavily depleted occurring so that basically government agencies can start to understand whether they have to do any future predictions about resource uh, depletion. So sort of resource depletion and social uh, issues from materials and, and substance um, perspectives, but also, uh, as sort of mentioned, uh, a leading indicator for many of these requirements is, is uh, eco labels. So when we start to see an issue coming up from an eco label or an NGO, it may not become law in the future, but that's certainly an indicator as to where um, these uh, issues uh, are heading. So many companies that, that we work with really look at those uh, NGO, NGO issues or requirements emerging, and even if they don't take immediate action, we'll start to see, well, are, they, are we actually using any of those materials or substances becoming of a concern for non-governmental uh, organisations or government white papers, and then be able to review their products so that if it does become a legal obligation, they're prepared and basically can look at alternatives or strategies for being able to deal with those um, changing um, substances and as they change and develop over time. Okay. Um, we've got another question here, um, and it is, do ThinkStep have a similar platform looking at compliance with social issues, e.g. the mm. ETI base code, workforce welfare, conditions, human rights, etc.? Hmm. I'd have to probably get, probably because that sort of fits into more of our um, CSI area, I could certainly respond and get a person to respond to those issues, certainly with our, our SOFI product in terms of 
uh, facilities or CSR issues. They're managed within our SOFI um, product in terms of social impacts associated with that and being able to do reporting um, on those um, issues that, that we cover. But certainly that would be more of the SOFI uh, issue in terms of um, social impacts and the sort of reporting that is done on that. But certainly we, we do uh, work in, in that area and provide software tools um, for those uh, areas beyond um, products uh, as, as such. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think that's us coming up to the time quite nicely. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we can, we can call it there. Um, mm -hmm. As I previously said, we'll, um, we'll be in touch with everyone following on from this just to uh, provide a link to the recording and you can, um, we'll try and summarize some of the questions and answers mm -hmm. uh, there as well. And mm -hmm. if you do walk away from the webinar and suddenly think there was something you wish you'd asked, you can mm -hmm. leave a question on that page as well and Andrew will be able to get back to you there. Mm. Um, yep. Again, more but, than yep. happy to help at any stage. If people have any questions and uh, even if it's just out of interest, we're more than happy to, to help based on interest from today. Perfect. Well, look, thank you very much for your time, Andrew. That was very interesting. Mm. Um, and uh, like I say, we'll look forward to uh, to hearing some more some more feedback from you over the over the coming days and weeks. Yep. Okay. Great. Well, uh, thanks very much. Thanks very much for uh, uh, organising this, and thanks for everyone for attending. And as I said, more than happy to help with any generic questions and, and issues that people may have based on this particular uh, topic or content. Perfect. So thank you everyone for attending. We hope you find that useful. Um, we'll be in touch in the next day or so with a link where you can catch up on um, on what uh, what the questions and answers were. So thank you very much, and we'll uh, yeah, be in touch. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye.